son gouvernement le 15 novembre 1990 lors du débat sur la création de la contribution sociale générale. Emmanuel Macron will have gotten his pension reform out of the way early in his second mandate, but at what cost his prime minister triggering a vote of confidence rather than uh, a, a straight uh, up or down on the bill itself. How will the railroading through Parliament of a plan that sparked France's biggest strikes and demonstrations in years test the legitimacy of a term-limited president and his minority government? This in his future dealings with the unions and lawmakers. Under General de Gaulle's 1958 constitution, the French president's perfectly within his right to force Parliament's hand. But was it smart politics? We'll ask why Macron was so hell-bent on raising that retirement age from 62 to 64, and whether it's all over. Unions vow to keep on striking and marching. Just because the bill passes doesn't mean the street can't still force the government to backtrack. Also, what about the long run? If the president breaks the resolve of unions and parliament, who stands to gain the 2019 Yellow Vest movement? Rude, out-of-touch elites, a theme championed by the far right's Marine Le Pen. Could Macron's method be a vote-getter for the populists who oppose him? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're looking at an Emmanuel Macron who's opted for uh, what French constitutionalists would call the nuclear option. And joining us is Annabelle Lever, professor of political philosophy at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. How are you? Very well, thank you. Uh, on this busy day, Lex Paulson, director of the School of uh, Collective Intelligence at Rabat's Mohamed VI Polytechnic University. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. And uh, Mathieu Doiré, director, director of polling at Ipsos. How are you? Fine. Uh, from Cambridge, Massachusetts, Yves saint omer guest professor at the Ash Center for Democratic Governments and Innovation at Harvard's Kennedy School. Welcome to the show. Thank you. The France 24 debate, where you can join the conversation you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. It would have been a close vote, but we'll never know. The prime minister. Uh, forced to shout over the opposition benches, benches which, by the way, were singing the Marseillaise, the, the national anthem. Uh, this while she triggered Article 49.3 of the Constitution, which turns pension reform into a vote of confidence. Jenny Shin has more. The French anthem sung by the opposition echoes within the walls of the National Assembly as the Macron administration invokes a special constitutional power, Article 49.3. The controversial pension reform bill is being forced through Parliament without a vote. Today, we are faced with uncertainty that hinges on a few votes. We cannot take the risk of 175 hours of parliamentary debate collapsing. On the basis of Article 49.3 of the Constitution, I engage the responsibility of my government on the pension reform bill. The move will ensure the bill raising the retirement age by two years to 64 is adopted, following President Emmanuel Macron's failure to secure a majority in Parliament. Opposition parties say the pension overhaul is deeply unfair and says such a move could unleash intense anger among unions and protesters who've engaged in eight rounds of nationwide protests and cross-sector strikes over the past several months. By announcing the use of Article 49.3, the Prime Minister has just humiliated and flouted Parliament once and for all. This government is unworthy of our democracy or the French Republic. This reform is completely illegitimate. The fact that they deployed Article 49.3 after trumpeting everywhere that they had a solid majority demonstrates at the same time their invalidity, their incompetence and their total lack of respect for democracy. Opposition parties are set to file a no-confidence motion in the coming days. If the motion succeeds, the pension bill could be shelved. Uh, Yves Saint-Omer, I'll begin with you because you've probably spent a, a part of the day explaining Article 49.3 to Americans where you are. Uh, it, it's kind of like a, a veto in reverse. Instead of saying no to something, the executive branch of government uh, gets to have its way over that of parliament? Yes, because in order then to refuse the law, the parliament has to vote no confidence 
to the government. This vote should uh, get a majority of MPs, and it means that all oppositions have to join for this, from the far right to the far left and to the right. And this is nearly impossible, actually, in France now. So with this uh, method, the government is nearly sure to get the law approved, or at least to pass the law without approval from the parliament. Uh, again, there will be that vote of confidence, but if uh, Yves Saint-Omer is to be believed, Mathieu Douaré, it will be uh, a, a formality. Um, is this standard fare, what we're witnessing? Is this just the way French democracy always works? No, it, it's uh, factually, it's something that was introduced into our constitution in 1958, inspired uh, actually by the German constitution of uh, 1949. So the in both, on, on, actually, the, the idea was the same in both constitutions, not to repeat the errors of the past when parliamentary was uh, pure, uh, inspired by the, the Westminster model, where basically government could, uh, the cabinet, the government could be uh, uh, defeated uh, on practically a, any occasion. Yeah, because it had, what, 25 governments in 12 years under the the, the previous constitution. In Absolutely. France. And uh, and so the in itself, it's, it has been extensively used, mostly when uh, the president or the prime minister uh, could not rely on an overwhelming majority of MPs. So the two periods so far have mostly been clearly identified as uh, Michel Rocard's uh, mm. government, 1988-1991, uh, for the very and, same and now reason. We're, we're up to what eleven times they've used it since yeah. uh, since last, and it's happened in a year even since uh, since the new parliamentary session. Yeah, but because this time the, the the majority is even thinner than it used to be at that time, so we we are probably breaking a record. Uh, it's the one hundredth time, in fact, Article Forty Nine Three has been used, but a lot in the last year. Lex Paulson, is this democratic? Uh, absolutely not. But is it legitimate? Absolutely yes. I mean, this is this is legal, uh, and no rule is being broken. Um, this is, as you say, a extreme. Uh, recourse that that Macron is is choosing to use. He's choosing because he didn't call the vote. He could have called the vote and seen um, how many of the 61 swing votes from the Republicans would have actually voted down the reform. Um, I worked in the U.S. Congress. The rule number one is learn how to count. Yeah. Um, and Nancy Pelosi certainly certainly would never have gotten to this level, uh, this stage in a reform without knowing uh, how to count to majority plus one. And clearly Elizabeth Bond didn't succeed in, in, in doing that. But it's absolutely legitimate and absolutely... She even admitted so... Uh, at the rostrum of the National Assembly. Exactly right. But but let's be very careful what we mean by democracy. We don't live in a democracy. The French live in a republic. That means the French elect people to do the governing. Uh, in this case, it's a blunt instrument in that you have a, a Senate that's passed this reform. You have an Assemblée that doesn't have a, a single party with a majority and that rules essentially by coalition. And you have this mismatch between the people who are against the law, who are in the street now, who are predominantly workers and people on the left, and the people who refuse to vote for the reform today were essentially deputies on the right. Um, who held the fate of Macron's reform in their hands. And these are the people who are least likely to care how many people are in the Place de la Concorde. These would have been people in the country houses during the last time that they were cutting off heads in the Place de la Concorde. Um, and they were the ones who caused this reform to go down, uh, and not uh, because of the show of strength in the street, I have to say it. But no, this is both totally legitimate and utterly anti-democratic at the same time. Totally legitimate and anti-democratic. Would you agree with that, uh portrayal of Annabelle Lever? No, I mean, I, I wouldn't say it was anti-democratic. I wouldn't say it was very democratic. I mean, clearly, the way this worked, it seems to me, is from the beginning, Macron's tried to limit debate on, on his project, on his reform project. This is the last step in that. Oops, I've just lost my... Your earpiece. My earpiece. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if it matters. We'll find it. Yeah. <laughs> so um, in that sense, it's not anti-democratic, but the problem is it's clearly anti-deliberative. And this has been going on for a very long time, his refusal to hear the unions, um, to debate with people who disagree with him. But to me, the irony of this, other than what the Republicans have done, is that he's now going to be forced to deliberate and deal with people and compromise for, I take it, the next six months. So instead of having a calm and sort of reasoned deliberation at the beginning, knowing that his position de was... De delib debate, deliberate with who? Well... Uh, personally, I would have said with the unions, certainly with the CFDT, partly with the, with the Conservatives, because as we now see, they're divided. But they're also, I mean, 
people, the socialists, it's not like everyone is completely unreasonable other than him. So the idea of taking this position where you try and lock yourself into a corner and force everyone else to give up and do what you want isn't very dem it isn't very democratic, but above all, it's not deliberative. And the whole point about an Assemblée Nationale, like the Parliament, is this is meant to be a place where you can deliberate and deal with your differences. Yeah, and just because the reforms passed uh, doesn't mean it's over. Back in 2006, the demonstrations continued after the government of uh, Jacques Chirac and Dominique de Villepin had passed a bill to loosen uh, labor law for young people. And that time, the street won. Uh, the bill was withdrawn. Cue those live pictures from uh, Place de la Concorde uh, this Thursday evening. And you're seeing that uh, spontaneously, Mathieu Doiré, uh, we had people, uh, people who've shown up and who, if we show those live images, are still there uh, right now. Uh, Macron wins in Parliament. Could he, the street, force him to back down no, still? Yeah, I don't think he, he, he won in Parliament. Mm -hmm. I think the, what, what the crisis revealed is the, the, the impossibility of a deliberative democracy in France. So it's deliberate and non-deliberative because uh, actually the only thing that works is gaullism or Bonapartism for that matter. That is, a chief is elected by a plebiscite. Uh, why? People why, should have why is that? Why twice, do the maybe? Why is this? Why is why can't France have, you know, compromise like they do? Parliamentarism in, other... in France only uh, was only uh, and really uh, in, in uh, I would say uh, working from uh, 1870 to uh, uh, 1940. It it was very criticized but very resilient. Then uh, after the Second World War, it was obvious that by excluding too many parties. We, 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 are, we were in the process of destroying deliberative democracy. And then in 1958, we went back to the, uh, the solution that we had adopted after only four years of uh, universal male uh, suffrage. In 1852, we had uh, this kind of dictatorship that actually seems to be the only way. You're calling it a dictatorship? France. It's a, it's a legal dictatorship, yeah, in a way. But Yves Saint-Omer, is, is, does France have a legal dictatorship? We used to say that France is a, a kind of a, a republican monarchy. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Perhaps the word is better than a dictatorship. But we have to say that democracy cannot be reduced to elections. Democracy is also the social dialogue with unions, and in this case, this has not been done, and all unions, all unions, even the most moderate unions, are against the reform. Democracy is also to take care, to listen to the majority of citizens, and in this case, polls show that a huge majority of citizens are against the reform. <coughs> Democracy is also the debate within the parliament, and in this case, there was no majority, and this is why uh, Macron decided to use this article, this non confidence vote. So the, the, the state of democracy in France is very bad at the moment. Uh, the President Macron, a couple of years ago, said he wanted to uh, create uh, the Republic of Permanent Deliberation. But we have the feeling, look at these images, that it's the Republic of the uh, Permanent Chaos. And we can be very afraid about the state of our democracy and about what will happen in the next couple of years. Permanent chaos, Lex Paulson? I mean, I, I think what you've said is, is really, really important um, for, for our viewers to, to understand that France is one at the same time has this monarchic uh, heritage, but also has shown itself able and willing to experiment with new forms of democracy, new forms of citizen participation. I would say I would take a different position of Mathieu. I don't think the problem is too much democracy or too much liberation, but not enough democracy. We see citizens when they feel that they haven't been able to contribute their ideas, their, their observations, their preferences in making the law, they use the only tools left to them, which is voting for anti-establishment parties or or going into the street. And there should be way more, many, many more channels of participation. And Yves Saint-Omer wrote very eloquently about uh, channels that have been uh, inspired by places like Brazil um, uh, in participatory budgeting and now in citizens' assemblies and many publics. There's a whole wave of new ways for citizens to participate. It's not chaotic. It can be organized and structured, but we need the political will and we need the public understanding that we do not yet 
live in a democracy. We could. We, France could be a democracy, mm. but we have to ask for it and we have to build it. Again, if you're just joining us here on France 24, uh, there was months of uh, deliberation, uh, national strike days. It came down to the prime minister uh, announcing a little after 3 p.m. Paris time uh, that uh, the bill was being uh, pulled and instead it would pass uh, via this uh, Article 49.3 of the Constitution, effectively turning it into a vote of confidence immediately afterwards. People started converging on Paris's Place de la Concorde, where we can cross to France 24's uh, Claire Pacalin. Night has fallen. Still a lot of people behind you. Certainly, there are several thousand people who have gathered here at the Place de la Concorde, just opposite the National Assembly. I can see the National Assembly from where I'm standing. It really is just on the other side of the River Seine. I've had a little talk to people who've been demonstrating. We've got a mix of profiles in there. Trade unionists who are there, who are coming out to say they are appalled by the government's use of the Article 49.3. That, of course, is a part of the French Constitution, which means the government can push through this pension reform without a vote in Parliament. But I've also seen a lot of young people here, Francois, students. I just spoke to a couple of students at the Sorbonne who told me that they're coming out tonight because this is their future. They feel unhappy about what they see as unfair terms for women, women who sometimes take out time from their work to bring up children. They say they will be penalised by this new reform, as well as people who have long careers, people who start working young, Many people who are in manual labour jobs tend to do that. So the young people I've been talking to say, yes, not going to affect them for quite some time. We're talking 40-odd years, but it's their future and they feel strongly about it. Of course, the government says, and we heard Elizabeth Bonn again in Parliament saying today that she has tried to negotiate, she has tried to make compromises, she has made compromises. She said that this bill needs to become law if France is to balance the books and keep its pension system afloat. Uh, Claire, well, qu quickly, one, one, one final question for you. Uh, we've seen uh, over the past weeks uh, there's been these punctual strike days. Uh, are people talking up uh, their, the willingness to stage a, a, a more permanent kind of general strike? Certainly the people I've been speaking to here tonight feel that the use of the current, the 40, I'm about to say it in French, sorry, the 49.3 article of the French Constitution to push through the legislation without a vote in Parliament, people I've been speaking to here tonight, they feel that was a provocation. That's fired them up. Not only them, the dustbin collectors who've been striking for more than a week now, which explains why you're seeing large piles of rubbish on the streets of Paris that have not been cleared up. They are on strike, those dustbin collectors on strike, and they're planning to carry on their strike to at least next Monday. And their strike is particularly visible. Um, it's certainly something you can smell and see in certain parts of Paris as well. You can see it, you can smell it. So, no, I would say, if anything... The protesters that I've been speaking to here tonight and the trade unionists that I've been talking to on the phone are more fired up than ever. Claire Pacalin, live from Paris's Place de la Concorde, uh, across from the National Assembly. Many thanks for that update. Yeah, we can cue those pictures up uh, of the garbage strike. It's day 10 here in the capital uh, with picketers and the socialist mayor of Paris so far shrugging off the state's order uh, to return to work uh, before the theatrics of the National Assembly. Morning commuters at uh, Paris's Gare de l'Est were treated to cries of general strike. The head of the moderate CFDT trade union, Yves Saint-Omer, was talking about him, uh, blaming the president for this polarization that's unfolding. We were never in a warlike mentality. We're in a mentality of social conflict that is rooted and won't disappear tomorrow. The people won't erase from their memories what has just unfolded and the feeling of being misled, especially those who were very present during the lockdown during the health crisis and who are among the most impacted by this pension reform. Mathieu Duarte, the president's not listening. No, yeah, actually the problem is that he is, um, once again, he, he is a monarch, uh, a Republican monarch. But we like it that it's way, got, is what you're yeah, saying. Yeah, we probably unconsciously like it this way because we don't know how to do uh, differently. And there are several reasons which were more or less obvious in what you both said. That is that unions are weak in France. They are even weaker than in, uh, in the U.S. Uh, the president is stronger than in the U.S., by the way, uh, because unions are weak. 
parliament is traditionally weak and is even weaker now because there is actually people people me included in a way hoped that maybe uh, the lack of an absolute majority would make it stronger but actually uh, parties are weak and so the behavior of, mm -hmm. of of MPs doesn't allow them to 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 leverage their their new power they are let, let just, they, they are not accountable a Annabelle Lever, when you compare with the UK, yes, uh, where we watch the rest, the whole world watches the theatrics every week with prime minister's question time, uh, when you look at the, the 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 power of the parliament versus the power of number ten of the prime minister's office, how does that compare with here? Um, I don't know. I kept thinking about it today. I think. Well, I was thinking of it more in terms of why this feels so scary in a way that what is really genuinely a depressing situation in England um, doesn't. Because to me, as a foreigner, France feels well governed, um, especially compared to England. And yet the fact that you don't have a strong left, the fact that you, in fact, you don't have a strong opposition, really, um, that it looks as though the closest opposition is Le Pen, and that's really frightening is a problem. But if I may, can I just say something? One of the things that seems to me so troubling about what happened, about the failure to have a vote today, is that we urgently need to talk about what work in France should look like and what it does look like. And so much of what we've seen has been this issue of hard work, people who feel they can't keep going until they're 60, let alone 62 or 64. And yet we don't have any real, we haven't had a forum in which we could talk about these things. And clearly the Assemblée Nationale isn't going to be that forum. We need to find some other forum. But at the moment, it seems to me, the unions aren't providing that forum either. And this, to me, is terribly troubling, because if you want to try and make progress on something that, after all, is really essential, we need to find some way to talk to each other about something that's actually really important. Lex Paulson, uh, there was this... Uh after the Yellow Vest movement, this uh, national debate that Grand took débat. place, uh, the Grand Débat, uh, it was a s success at the time, but then there's kind of a boomerang effect because people feel with hindsight that they weren't listened to. Exactly right. So it's not that citizens in France don't want to contribute. It's not that they don't have intelligent things to say. It's not that these issues um, you know, are somehow yes or no issues and it's just as simple as electing people to get, to, to get on with it. No, these are very tricky, complex issues. The problem is that politicians have not yet defined the scope in which they are able and willing to let citizens participate and help create public policy. We have uh, the 150 uh, members of the, of the climate uh, convention that did an incredible job um, and, and proposed a law that was almost entirely diluted by the uh, Assemblée Nationale. Uh, we have currently a citizens convention uh, for end of life care. These are everyday people chosen according to uh, random, uh, you know, according to representativity. Citizens in France want to contribute. They are smart. They are diverse. They are very engaged. They're very highly educated versus other countries. Yeah. Why can't we make France more democratic and give more channels? You would avoid this kind of uh, conflict, which frankly, you know, letting trash pile up in the street, it does not help contribute to a political debate. Um, it's a blunt instrument. It's like trying to send a message to your grandmother by going into Times Square and screaming. Uh, yes, maybe someone who knows her might hear, but this is not, uh, this is no longer a productive way of making laws in France. It's just the way that everybody knows. And so, well, we have to go on strike because that's what we know how to do. But I think France has proven through these new experiments in deliberative democracy that it can do better and it should do better. The politicians need to catch up. Yves Saint-Omer, what's the recipe? I mean, we have a, a, a very dynamic and, and active civil society. We have to take this into account. This is a resource for democracy and for the country. Now, uh, President Macron has organized a couple of years ago a randomly selected citizen assembly with lay citizens discussing on how France could face uh, its uh, commitments to solve the climate crisis. We could now have something similar organized, exactly. a citizen assembly, which was discussed about the reform of the pension system, and then proposed to a referendum at large the solution that would be del deliberatively uh, discussed and adopted by this convention. This is not impossible. I mean, in Ireland, uh, this has been done for 
the debate on same-sex marriage, on abortion, and for these both very important examples in a Catholic country such as Ireland, at the end of the day, uh, the people at large have adopted the proposal that was uh, uh, that has been elaborated by this citizen assembly. I think we have to find a way of getting out of this, uh, this situation, which is a real danger for democracy at the time being, and not only now, but for the years to come. But the counter argument, I'll put it to Annabelle Lever, is uh, what about the, uh, you're already diluting what uh, was described by Mathieu Duarte as a, a weak parliament if you're yeah, creating I mean, my worry, these new structures. My worry about citizen assemblies is that, I mean, certainly what we saw in Ireland was there wasn't just one. There were lots and lots mm. and lots. So the idea that we're going to have one, we should have one on the climate, one on... That just seems to me a complete mistake. You're talking about 250, 250 people chosen, and most of them didn't... Are only a fraction of those who wanted to participate. What we need to do is, I think, certainly revive local democracy, which is in terribly bad shape and would be a forum in which people can talk. But you also need to revive, I think, workplace democracy, unions. I mean, citizen, mm. citizen assemblies are good, but that you need permanent forums and permanent ways for lots of deliberation because these problems are so complicated and they're ongoing. But to, to take what you're pointing about Parliament, this is actually a really ironic um, uh, outcome from the two 2017 elections, is that Emmanuel Macron brought into Parliament a majority of essentially non-politicians, yes. first-time candidates. This was and, his first time he was elected. And then several, you know, many of those people are, are, are now re-elected to a second mandate or, or new people have come in. Well, it, you know, at the time, this was thought to be a great step forward for the actual deliberative quality of the Assemblée because people coming from you know, they're farmers, they're carpenters, they're doctors. There was Cedric, uh, the mathematician. Yeah. Um, so arguably that, but what had to, what's actually happened is it's given the government very little leverage over the deputies when they really need their votes. And it's because they're not career politicians. So what leverage do they have? And so at this critical moment, when the government really needed these people to vote, uh, it couldn't count on them. Yeah, because what do you do for the, 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 France has not resumed itself to Paris. So what do you do if uh, yeah. you need the party machines in big yeah, cities exactly. like uh, Nantes, uh, Lyon, Lyon, yeah. no, Lyon, I think, Lyon, I think uh, yeah, probably you need, you, you, I think there are many commonalities with the U.S. and part, part of the solution could be inspired by the U.S. That is more local government taking responsibility because there are so many differences across the territory. And one thing about uh, those uh, deliberative assemblies, the problem is that as a rule, they are generally managed by being fed yes. with content provided by experts. And if I were a hawkish conservative, I would make the observation that of all the possible solutions to, uh, to, to curb uh, carbon emissions, the only one that was not picked by uh, this representative neutral assembly was the only one that the most acknowledged experts considered the most efficient, that is a price for carbon, awkwardly called a carbon tax. And you could take for granted that if we had done the same with the same kind of experts on pensions, everything would have been proposed except increasing the age. So I'm saying that the problem also is that opinion makers, opinion leaders, opinion formers are biased to the left in France, just like in the US. And of course, that prompts on other issues like immigration, a strong backlash, which is not good mm -hmm. either. And so it makes citizens quite confused. And so parties are supposed to be uh, and unions are, are supposed to be the places, the low-key, where you can solve those contradictions. Because I think there are so many contradictions in the, the world we're living in today that it is impossible to just believe that people would spontaneously come up with a solution. Annabel Lever. Yeah, I was just wondering, we've talked about unions. I think that's very important. We've talked about parties, which are clearly critical in a democracy. But it is interesting. I wonder if there isn't a gap where the church used to be. Um, I'm not very good on French history, but it is striking that a sort of body that had a right version and a left version used to have a really a left Catholicism mm. that could act at some level as a an mediator. intermediate. Mm. Yeah, mm. but that's collapsed. And my feeling is that in part France lacks that nowadays, and this makes for a lot of violence on issues of immigration, but also perhaps on issues like pension reform. It, the, the the issue of what happened in Parliament is particularly cogent because of, and there was a lot of theatrics uh, this Thursday, uh, because when Emmanuel Macron was re-elected 11 months ago, 
Uh, here in France, we stagger the vote. First you have the presidential election, then you have the legislative elections. He asked voters to give him another majority in the legislative elections that followed. That didn't happen. Instead, the parliament found itself mm -hmm. split in three, roughly, mm -hmm. uh, with a centrist majority forced to look elsewhere for votes. Uh, mostly, you can see in blue on that uh, pie chart is uh, the conservative Les Républicains. Uh, the president was forced to concede at the time that his uh, would be uh, what he called a relative majority. Its responsibility is to broaden out, either by building a coalition contract or by constructing majorities bill by bill. Yes, to act in your interest and in that of the nation, we must collectively learn to govern and legislate differently, to build with the new assembly's political formations in a spirit of dialogue, listening and respect. How did that plan go for dialogue, uh, listening, and respect? Uh, uh, the results say. were not great, right? Well, it's, it seems to be his fault and his alone. He's railroading through this reform without, we've talked about it, the I dialogue mean, that we've been... Railroading makes it sound like he's doing something legitimate. Again, the Constitution that was created for the Fifth Republic was created to compensate for the weakness of the Fourth Republic, which was too much chaos in the Assembly. So it gave the executive more power. Why is he so power. insistent on this reform? It was well, in his platform. It was in his platform. 18 million French people voted for him. Again, this is a, a blunt... The election but then they is voted against him in the legislative election. I mean, this is why elections are, as Yves Saint-Omer just said, are a very poor proxy for actual democratic expression because you are given such a limited choice. Macron, I thought actually in one-on-one -on -one interviews, did a very good job of explaining the logic behind this reform. And having worked in, in Congress during the first two years of Obama, I know that, that the first year after an election is really your only chance mm -hmm. to do anything difficult. As Mathieu said... Uh, we're not good long-term thinkers as a species. And mm -hmm. so sometimes it needs someone with a clear vision who is just, you know... And we are selfish. <laughs> we're selfish. Someone with clear vision is bloody-minded. But we also have the ability to be reasonable and to look mm -hmm. at numbers and to actually, you know, make more far-sighted decisions. The question is, do we delegate that rational long-termism to yeah. technocrats, to people who go to école de ma you know, administration? Or do we try to create a public education system where the average person sees the wisdom of not having a deficit of 15 billion euros uh, in, in your where, you know, the, just to give it one number, one number, the, the, the age, uh, life expectancy when I was born in 1980, uh, 75. Now it's 82. Okay, so the average French person is living seven years longer. How can we expect to have exactly the same rules around retirement when the life expectancy has changed by seven years? The average French person, I think, is rational enough and reasonable enough to, to understand that. But Macron has not convinced the public of the necessity of this reform. He has yeah. not used what Obama called the fierce urgency of now. And, and he's not told the story in a convincing enough way that the French people see why this reform mm -hmm. is needed. Yves Saint-Omer, again, you're, you're in Massachusetts right now. Uh, is it difficult explaining to Americans uh, th this reform? It's a bit difficult because they say, well, 62, that's not, that's not very late. Uh, <laughs> why? Uh, why is it that the French people refuse uh, this reform? Are you really, I mean, not wanted to work? Um, we have to explain for mm. this that first, France is a country in which for people who are above 55, it's very difficult to find a job if you lose your job. And unemployment at this age is huge. So that if you postpone the pensions um, to 64, then it will mean for a lot of people more years of unemployment. Another dimension which is quite important is that the life expectancy is quite different from one social group to the other. As a university professor, statistically, I and people like me will live six or seven more years than a blue-collar worker. Is it just that the age and the number of years uh, of, uh, uh, I mean, working um, be the same for all of us? Uh, this is another problem. And is it just that the people who have begun to work at 18 years old or even before we we'll have to wait, like people who have begun to work much later, to the same age, 64. So 
We have a problem with this reform, which was not clear, uh, which has been justified with several arguments. The first one was financial, but financial for the pension system or financial for other public policies, for justice, and so on and so forth. So we are really in a bad situation uh, as a time being, and I think that the responsibility of the government and the president is huge in this situation. Yves Saint-Omer, uh, what does your research at Ipsos find when it comes to uh, to Macron and to, to what he's, he's yeah. decided? I think there are two pieces of research that deserve to be uh, uh, looked at at the same time. That is, on the one hand, of course, that has damaged Macron's uh, rating, and particularly among conservative voters, which means that once again they are conservative on social issues, but increasingly not conservative, increasingly liberal on economic and social and um, mm. um, welfare issues, which is which is the the, the major issue that uh, um, Chirac and Sarkozy were actually uh, also dealing with. Uh, they could not deliver on the conservative part of their economic agenda because actually even their voters were not that conservative. The other thing, the other thing is that people in a, in a, in, a, in another poll we did a few uh, months before, uh, I would say the the storm, people uh, acknowledged that they did not really understand how their pension system works, that they didn't really know how much they were entitled to, and that they didn't really. New, uh, no, sorry, uh, how to, uh, to fix the system. The reality is that, indeed, uh, we would need experts to uh, shed some light on the debate. But the problem is that, at the same time, we are dealing with issues which are so individual. I mean, everyone is, uh, you special know, case. Say, say, yeah, <laughs> yeah, saying no at one door, as we say in France. Yeah. And, uh, and the, last, the last thing I think uh, is important is to look at other countries. There is a debate on raising the uh, retirement age in Spain. And in this particular case, the socialist government is pushing for increasing the age. And um, um, actually, uh, co uh, company leaders oppose it because they don't want to pay for what it would cost them to keep people uh, employed longer. And the real major issue that even technocrats are, have not uh, probably enough uh, thought about and worked on and explained is how we can keep people employed longer. Mm. Rather than uh, rather than when they retire, is how to keep those old, older mm. older citizens uh, in the workforce. Annabel Lever. Yes, I mean it seems to me one of the difficulties, especially when I think about the different options, is it's hard to separate out pension reform from the level of unemployment you have, and importantly from the level of disability you have. Um, disability care, because clearly what happens in England is people who are sick at fifty five go on disability, or they become unemployed, or they just sort of really end up on these horrible, tiny, tiny um, sums of money until they retire. But that's not the French way. And I think, you know, if you live in France, you appreciate why it's not the French way. But then I think to try and separate out a debate about pensions from a debate about disability and unemployment is very difficult because, in a way, they're a package that have to go together. All right, there's consensus on the panel that there, there, there needs to be, when you're broaching something so complex, uh, a, a lot of toing and froing. It's not the, the, the French way, says Mathieu Dry. It's certainly not uh, the, the Macron way. Uh, <laughs> what does this mean, though, politically for France uh, go, going forward? Because uh, and we've just had, by the way, uh, Lex Paulson, the announcement by the trade unions, another national day of strike. It's been called for next Thursday. Uh, so uh, this this showdown is far from over at this particular point in time. Um, it, will this, again, sap the legitimacy of the president and of the parliament, what we just saw unfold? So use the word legitimacy. I think it's a really important word. Because, again, nothing that Emmanuel Macron has done is even remotely unconstitutional or illegal. Um, however, legitimacy is in the eye of the, of the beholder. 
and the citizens are in the street because they feel like this action of passing a law without a vote, it just doesn't feel right. So even though it's constitutional, it's perceived as illegitimate and perception is what matters in, in politics. So if I could say just one positive thing uh, for Macron, you look at youth unemployment. What the Macron government has done in creating apprenticeships, almost a million young people are in apprenticeships, the largest number ever. Youth unemployment is, 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 is way down. Um, you know, Macron actually has done some very positive things uh, to create economic opportunity uh, in this country, and but you know, very few people know about it or, or talk about it. So it's not as if uh, Emmanuel Macron's uh, record is is purely an anti-worker record, but it certainly looks that way now. So I would say that Emmanuel Macron, if he's going to hold his ground, and he gives every uh, indication that he will, needs to shift the subject to talking about other issues related to economic justice and opportunity, where he actually has done some very good work and and could go further uh, working with the unions and other and other partners. But do you listen society. when you're in your second term? When you're, you know, I'm not sure how much Emmanuel Macron ever listens uh, per se. Um, he's a very, he's very convinced of his own uh, of his own intelligence. But I think, uh, I think Macron, he's, uh, he's shown in Gilets Jaunes before, and I think we'll see again that he understands a crisis when he sees it, and he knows that he'll have to do something a little bit differently. Let's hope that that involves more listening and dialogue and some more of his uh, his creativity. Uh, Yves Saint Omer, we saw very different reactions uh, from the opposition in Parliament this Thursday, on the left. Uh, calls for action, for more strikes, uh, for people to come out in the street. Uh, on the far right, Marine Le Pen saying, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's uh, meet at the polling station in 2027 when there's the next uh, presidential election. Her more softly, softly approach to street protests, is that a winning gamble? I mean, it's very hard to say what will happen in the next couple of years and in the next election. Uh, what is clear is that uh, Marine Le Pen on the far right uh, has a strategy of becoming respectable. And the other dimension is that in France, there is a huge tradition of social protest from the left, from the far right, it's not that frequent that uh, huge mobilization in the street uh, is happening. So I would say that uh, Marine Le Pen plays a strategy, which is we'll be respectable and we'll win in the next election, which is possible, actually, which is possible. Nobody would have said this 15 years ago, 10 years ago. And now this is an option for France. And the left, uh, which is quite weak at party level, which is not that strong at union level, plays also what she can do, namely uh, protest in the streets, mobilization, strikes, blockades, and, and so on. So I would say that each is in his or her role uh, playing this game. There's a lot of time between now and 2027, indeed, mm -hmm. Annabelle Lever. Yes, I think what worries me, though, about you know, this sort of on the one hand, the right sits tight and on the other, the left goes to the streets is that seems to miss out a lot of people around like where I live, which are in rural areas who are massively inconvenienced by some of these protests, but also are not heard in them. And so I wonder whether, in fact, you know, one of the things that's going to be really important, especially if you want for those who want to stop a Le Pen vote, is to find some way of getting a voice more effectively to large parts of France who are not caught up. Mm. By, um, by, by, yeah, demonstrations in Paris and Marseille. Yeah. Mathieu Doiré, a final word on this? Yeah, I, I think Marine Le Pen is uh, playing it like Merkel. That is, uh, she's hoping that in the coming months and years, Macron will do the bad job, the disgusting job, all the more so since he's a lame duck president, mm -hmm. and she will be elected then, uh, of course, on the rejection of what Macron did. So the, the painful we'll, reforms we'll that happened under reforms done. The painful reforms that happened Absolutely. under Schroeder in Germany, yeah. Merkel Absolutely. benefited Reaps from the benefit. Absolutely. Of course, and she's far smarter than Mélenchon, who probably has more convictions, more ideas about what should be done, but unfortunately for him, probably is in a, major, in a minority in terms of uh, his uh, social uh, uh, electorate. I would, uh, it's uh, it's his constituency. Marine Le Pen is, uh, is 
actually uh, in the process of creating a catch-all party with yeah. a very, very broad platform yeah. based on the blame game uh, and the rejection of everything that doesn't work, putting the blame, of course, on incumbents and proposing nothing in particular so that you won't uh, uh, frighten or disappoint yeah, anyone. Yeah. All right, a lot, of, a lot can happen uh, between now and the next election. What's certain is that you're going to have this vote of confidence, probably, followed by, again, a strike day next Thursday. So uh, that's what's uh, on people's minds for the immediate future. Lex Paulson, I want to thank you. I want to thank, uh, as well, Annabelle uh, Lever, Mathieu Doiré, Yves Saint-Omer for being with us from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you for joining us here. More coverage uh, of French politics on our website, France24.com. <laughs>